But I'm with you. I'm not a big car huh. fanatic either. I, I, I'm a bigger fan of the watches. And uh, obviously you have a pretty – I mean, amazing collection, especially of independence. And one thing that we get the benefit of, I guess, is to get your your kind of perspective, right? So owning, I guess, George Daniels, you own the anniversary, which he also worked on with, um, what was his name? Uh, Roger Smith, right? Mm -hmm. So they kind of collaborate on that one. And the Millennium, oh, yeah. both, both. What? Yeah, the Millennium was actually uh, Roger's first project with, with George. Exactly. George right. said he didn't want to make 54 watches. He right. made the prototype that he wore his entire life, you know, to prove that it worked. And then he was like, okay, Roger, you know, build the rest and this will be your chance to apprentice with me. You'll learn how I work by doing fundamentally. So the millennium was Roger's sort of trial by fire. Right. So yeah. that was, that's, that's the idea, right? But where, where I want to kind of get mm. uh, your perspective on is kind of comparing and contrasting the three or the four watchmakers, right? So or sorry, three, Daniels, uh, Roger Smith, and Dufour. Mm -hmm. How do they compare in their kind of wearing experience and how do they compare kind of overall for you? I find them all very comfortable to wear, if that's what you mean. I mean, I-, I Finishing wish... as well, like the, the whole the whole kind of idea, right? What, what... I, I guess I don't have enough watches really to compare them, you know, to, I don't have like, you know, 40 watches and I'm constantly switching them out and neither do I want to have that many watches. Um, but uh, I, I can, you know, tell you, I mean, from my little bit of experience, I do wear these watches every day. You know, I switch the ones that I have in and out. Um, they're super comfortable. They wear very well. They keep excellent time. Um, I don't fret about them too much when I'm wearing them. I mean, I'm sensible. I don't jump into the pool with them. But having said that, I do, I, I don't take them, you know, when I'm outside running, you know, I don't want to sweat all over them. But aside from that, you know, I, and I don't sleep with them, you know, on, but aside from that, I mean, I wear them all day long and um, every day. So they're super comfortable. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what else I can, you know, tell you. Ever have any mechanical issues with any one of them? No, I mean, I've, and, and admittedly, I've only had them a rather short time because I'm a newish, you know, compared to many of you here, newish collector. So um, uh, the Dufour, when I bought it, I had an agreement with uh, that it went back to Dufour at the time. Like, like that was part of the purchase agreement. Right. So he did whatever he did, you know, kind of thing. Um, the simplicity had never had a servicing. It had been built in 1999, ran 20 years perfectly. The the genius of the coaxial really having to do with that. And it had never had a servicing. So I did send that back to Roger. And while it wasn't a mechanical change, he said that the first simplicities, there was a detail about the way that the case held the crystal. Okay. And, um, it wasn't as water resistant as they would have liked. And Roger, you know, in these past years came to a better resolution because he did design the watch anyways, right. of how that could be more efficiently built. And so he said every simplicity he gets back now, he pops out the crystal, does his thing, and then pops it back in. Right. So, you know, but that's not a mechanical issue, but no, no. It's nice We're when talking you before, right? Not not Smith. No, no, right? no. Yeah, that, that that was that was the Daniels Millennium. Oh, the Daniels Millennium. Yeah, that was the Daniels Millennium. The Dufour went to Philippe and it came back and I think it was just he wanted to check it out. I don't even know if it needed a you know, whatever, a cleaning or whatever one would call it, a servicing per se. Exactly. Um the anniversary I've never had an issue with, so I've never sent it in. The Smith is a recent purchase. And um yeah, there's a couple of other things I have that haven't had services yet. So yeah, it's just. So yeah. you had your millennium updated per se? Yeah, I guess it, yeah. I okay. guess that would be the they right. They probably thing. shaved the crystal and used a special gasket. So that's yeah, cool. Yeah, there was something that's about, all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that that's absolutely correct. There was something about uh, the, the, the gasketing that, that yes. needed to be, that Roger had rethought over the years and decided would be a better resolution of the design, which I guess he just wasn't capable of when he first built them. And and I like the fact that, you know, there are these minute um, and incremental changes. It's the kind of thing that in my career, you know, in art, I, I look for the same sort of conservation practices. Of course. But to me, it makes, you know, it makes good sense to- Especially by the guy who built it. Yeah, so precisely. The trust is there, obviously. A hundred percent. I mean, I would never let anybody else do such a thing, but of course, you know, if Roger tells me that this is something he's doing with all of them now as they come back to him, yeah, 
It's so great. be it. Yeah, a hundred percent. So yeah. Anyways. Now, let me ask you, what speaks to you uh, about watchmakers, I guess? I mean, maybe the answer is obvious, right? They're probably the best watchmakers of this generation or the last one, right? With referring to Daniels and Dufour and Smith, right? Well, but, yeah, they're older. Yeah. I mean, right, exactly. Daniels but Aston and Dufour is older. Yeah. Exactly. I, I guess my, my question is, what, what makes the, those pieces in particular speak to you, maybe compared to their contemporaries like F.P. Jorn, maybe Resh Epershepi, Kerry Budalainen, or mm -hmm. you know, some of the other watchmakers yeah. that are world renowned. Oh, they're all great. I mean, it's just when I started the collection, I wanted to make sure as I would with an, a collection that I would advise, you know, in the art world, which is where I work, not in the horological world, that um, I always believe when I'm starting with collectors in, in anchor pieces, these are pieces that will be collection defining works that you will build around curatorially and um, now what that means to each person and their budget is a drastically different thing. That's not the issue. It's not about a lot of money. You could be buying Hublots and you could be buying swatches. I, I, I don't care. I, I'm very ecumenical when it comes Maybe to- Maybe not the Hublot. It's Maybe not about the price point, but it is in whatever area that you decide to collect in, which brings you meaning and pleasure. Um, you know, I'm always looking for what are the, what are the anchor pieces? What are the pieces that you can curatorially build a collection around? And in most cases, those pieces tend to be rarer and harder to find, whether it's a swatch or whether it's a Daniels. And um, you know that those usually take more care and more focus and more tenacity in order to find the example that would be in a um, uh, acceptable condition. Uh, you know, with all the accoutrements, if, if required box and papers and things like that, that it should or necessarily come with. Um, and uh, so for me, when I was beginning my thing to answer your question, and my interest was in the independence, it seemed like Daniels, who had passed, and Dufour, who was, you know, in his 70s, um, seemed like to be the godfathers, so to speak, of independent watchmaking, from my point of view, horologically, you know, from history. And if if I was going to jump into Rekshap or, or, or Kari or De Bethune or any of the other names that you were talking about, but not having done Daniels and Dufour, at a certain point, I really felt like the prices were moving even three years ago, and it was really going to start to get beyond my, you know, scope. My scope so it was yeah. kind of like I needed to move and move quickly. And time from a timing point of view, you know, my grandfather used to say to me, shit will do for luck if you have brains. And I got in definitely at sort of the right time because the Dufour prices in the last three years have, I mean, and the Daniels prices as well. and, and Roger. yeah. So, you know, I guess if you work in markets, any kind of market, cars, watches, art, wine, comic books, baseball cards, it doesn't matter. But if you work in a specific kind of market long enough, you start to understand and grasp these sort of, you know, concepts and um, your, more able to accept the risk and to assess um, what the requirements are more efficiently. So I hope that's it's, like, it's like the old guys we used to say, you get to sniff the tape. Yes. In the stock market, that's what they used to say, right? So that's precisely right. So yes. that's exactly what it is. So now that I have a couple of these things, I've now turned my, begun to turn my attention to other things now that I have the anchor piece, so to speak. Gotcha. I just want to get this super chat very quickly. We have the timepiece fund with five dollars. Thank you very much. Says Todd, great to have you on Marco's stream. You should take the humble genius. That's his nickname for me, although I'm far from a, a genius uh, under your wing. He says he is a worthy one. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Now, let me ask you a question because obviously, you know, to get into watches like George Daniels, like Philip Dufour, like Roger Smith, you have to have a certain I guess savoir faire is, is the best way to put it, right? You have to have a certain understanding, appreciation for kind of finer watches, right? And evaluate them be beyond, I would say, you know, kind of the dial and it, what a lot of, I would say, what a lot of people grab it, the brand and, and what have you, right? So I guess mm -hmm. my question to you is, what is it that you look for on a watch that you say, this is what makes it special? You know what I mean? So what no, are some I think, right yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, you're looking for a kind of horological historicity. You know, you want to know that you're buying a watch and a watch creator who you feel is in essence playing for history. So that would be 
one consideration, though not the only. Um, in many cases with a lot of the independents of this type, you know, it's not like you have 97 choices of watches anyways. It's not like Rolex where this year, you know, there's a platinum one with a blue dial and there's a gold one with a green dial and there's a, you know, a rose gold one with a purple dial. And then next year, you know, we're going to do a white gold model, but it's going to be one millimeter smaller and it's going to have a yellow dial. You know, I mean, it doesn't work like that. You know, I mean, the, the, it's not about branding and marketing. It's really about, there's a lot, basically that is about novelty. I'm interested in development, true development. I'm interested in aesthetic development. I'm interested in histor uh, historical development. Um, and uh, I'm interested in artistic development, uh, conceptual development. And those are the sorts of things that interest me you know, I made this sort of joke on the Hodinkee thing that I did where, you know, anybody, everybody here in this room, you know, and everybody who's watching, whatever, you know, nobody really collects watches to tell the time. No. I, my, you know, if I wanted to tell the time, I'd just buy a cheap watch or look at my phone. We collect watches. I mean, it, they need to tell the time. They need to do it accurately. That's part of their operation is part and their mechanism is part of the reason we buy them. But fundamentally speaking, we buy watches, whatever kind of watches, for different reasons. We collect watches for different reason, for, for a different reason than needing for, for, for their use value. And if I'm not buying something for its performance or its use value fundamentally, it's a it's something that's then based on taste. Yes. Those are the only two reasons why you buy something. You either buy something in a comparative quantitative way where you can line up five toasters or five refrigerators or five cars in a certain, you know, and you can line them up and decide which one is the best one based on their performance fundamentally. If you're not going to buy on that metric uh, and you're going to buy, like, say, a work of art or a watch or something like that, you can't line up five watches and talk about their performance value. You can't line up five artworks that are unrelated and talk about their performance value. You're buying for some other reason. And rather than the sort of quantitative data, the quantitative performance metrics, you're buying for the qualitative Okay, but for the qualitative components of these things that we're talking about. So these are radically different ways to view why a particular person decides to purchase or collect a specific thing. And it's really important that, you know, so when I'm talking about like the branding and the marketing and like novelty, that relates to the quantitative component of performance. When I'm right. talking about, um, you know, development, that relates to the qualitative component of taste. And those are two radically different things. I hope that that helps. No, that's answer. very, that's, that's that's how I do what I do, put why it. I do what I do. It does because you speak to the artistic expressionism of the artist who's developing that. And if it speaks to you, then that's all that matters. Right, and that and if, whether it speaks to you or not is based on your experience. Exactly. Expertise. And Correct. Expertise is based on experience. Yes. Experience is based up over time. You can't get experience faster. No. You can't no. make yourself experience stuff faster. No. It's based on time. So you have to be yes. willing to engage, you know, to kind of put in the time and the effort to gain the experience. Exactly. So you can start to have the expertise to make informed decisions about what you're buying as opposed to uninformed because everybody has an opinion about something. Of course. I like this, I don't like that. Well, that's an opinion. I mean, everybody has that, but I'm more interested in the sort of opinion that says, I'm interested in this watch because I understand the historical components of this and I understand the watchmaker and who they, he or she, hopefully we need more she's, who they relate to and you know the aesthetic design of the watch and the technical build of the watch as opposed to, oh, this year it's a platinum one with a purple dial and um, you know diamond uh, markers. You know, right. and here it's gonna be a gold one with a, a, a yellow face and you know, uh, mother of pearl markers like there that's an interest <laughs> exactly the former ladder interests me the latter doesn't now i want to come back to this question because uh, it's a very good one who are some up-and-coming watchmakers and manufacturers that you have your eye on but we did get an absolutely incredible super chat from the watch guy a hundred and forty dollars thank you so much that's <clears throat> incredibly generous saying we should title the stream watches euphoria todd levin thank you for your input I feel that my watch monkey in my brain has been nourished tonight. Marco, you're the man. Thank you so much. You are the man. That's incredibly kind and generous. Thank you very much. 
I guess let me give him some value for money in the question, which is to ask you, what are some kind of up and coming watch brands or watchmakers that you have your eye on that mm-hmm. you think, wow, these guys from a historical perspective, from what they're building up uh, mm-hmm. and achieving in the watchmaking world, you know, these are guys you should look out for. Well, I love looking at, you know, it's very important both in art and in watches for me that I continue to look at the new all the time because fundamentally, you know, the new is the entry point for new ideas and new approaches and new ways of of resolving and thinking about things. And you have to be willing to engage with that. If you're only going to look at the old stuff and the historical stuff, it's great, but you're sort of like not working your brain and your eye muscles. If you're just looking at, you know, everything but the new, even if you're not going to buy the new, even if you're not a buyer of the new, it's like going to the gym, right? Uh, I go to the gym six days a week because number one, I'm old. And number two, um, you know, you put your muscles under stress. And what happens, of course, is those muscle fibers tear at a a very micro level. And then when they knit get back together, you're stronger, ideally. And um, it's the same thing using your brain and your eyes. Like if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you use it on a regular basis, you can increasingly strengthen your ability to see and grasp ideas, um, I think, in a more meaningful way. So um, in terms, I look at a lot of young people. I I think for me, speakingly, to get to point is my next two purchases are going to be Rexap and Acrevia. Um, I hope to purchase both uh, a a Rexap, Rexapi, Chronometer Contemporary, as an Acrevia AK. Uh, one of the AKs as well, because I'd like to have, I think they're sort of related, obviously, same horologist, but they're very different approaches. And um, I'd like to have both of those. I think they're sensible. They would be sensible additions for the collection. And the price point right now, while, you know, expensive. Aren't cheap. Yeah, they're not not cheap. cheap, That's for sure. Um, I feel like, again, there's a window and the window is starting to close. And uh, that happened to me actually with Jorn. I really had a hard time with Jorn's watches uh, based strictly on their aesthetic design. I really dislike the font and all the writing all over the face. I don't need the logo and his name and the name of the watch and what it does. It just seemed superfluous from a design aesthetic point of view. But, you know, I can't get a good Jorn now for under a million bucks and I'm not going to pay a million bucks for a Jorn. So that's, <laughs> thus endeth that story for the day. But, you know, Rexep is really, you know, he's somebody I'm looking at. And there, there, there are a few others that I, I, I kind of twirl around in my mind. I don't know if I'll actually get there to putting my money down, but th- th- this at least is realistically what's next for me. No, that's an interesting perspective. And I just want to thank, again, the Watch Guy Inc. for the $140 Super Chat. Again, extremely kind and generous. And I feel very much appreciative of it. Um, Now, it's interesting because I resonate with a lot of what you had to say, right? So if you go back in watchmaking about, you know, 300 years, right? There's not a lot of things that watchmakers today are doing that is really revolutionary, right? So tourbillons have existed for what 200 or so years. So as the chain and fuse, so as the remontoir de galite, right? These are all complications that watchmakers have have been producing. You know, not not in scale, right? Obviously, they're very difficult to master and accomplish, but they've already done it. So what I look for in a wristwatch, in particular, is how it has evolved over time, right? That theory of telling time. So Jorn is one of them with the resonance, right? Yeah. So. Obviously, mm-hmm. Philip Dufour has a resonance, right? It's called the duality, if I'm not mistaken. It's not actually a resonance. Right, because it has a differential. It trains, but it doesn't operate on resonance. People exactly. think confuse that. So just right. to be clear, the true right. resonance was resolved by Jorn. Jorn, right. Jorn was the one. the first one who really resolved it. So and if I were to buy a Jorn realistically, I would want to buy, although I know everybody wants the Tourbillon Souverain because I guess people love Tourbillons. If I'm a Jorn buyer... For me, it would definitely have to be a resonance subscription because that's the sensible thing to buy based on the metric that you're talking about right now. Right. We got Cars and Chrono with a hundred dollars. Thank you so much. He says, both love jazz, watches art, but no cars. Well, nobody's perfect. Great to see Todd on. Sorry, couldn't join. Hopefully another time. And 
He's speaking of Rex Shep, he's actually, <coughs> I did a, a review of his collection and I recommended a Chronomech on top right adding to the collection. So Ooh. he's actually, he's actually going to, going to be getting one. But yeah, so going back to kind of, and again, thank you so much, Cards and Chronos, extremely generous, but he's a big, both a watch guy, but more so a car guy than anything. So I'm sure that kind of pulled at his heartstrings to know that. Well, I, have I love cars. Again, I'm from Detroit and I know my cars. I mean, I went through season after season after season of seeing the new releases through the 60s and 70s and the 80s. Um, but uh, the problem is, is if I were to buy a car, it would probably be a great vintage car, but then I can't take care of it properly in New Jersey. So I'm kind of at a, you know, th that's really what the problem is, you know, kind of thing, to be honest. So I'm relegated to probably not being able to indulge um, my wishes in that area as much as I can in, in, in others. So I have to be a touch more sensible. Right. So, so um, just going back right quickly to our conversation. So Jorn is the one who solved the theory of resonance, right? Mm. So that's one that I look at that's unbelievable, right? I think another one that's extremely underrated and very much overlooked is Moritz Grossman mm. because they produced the first ever wristwatch that has the hammer type system that mm. Breguet originally invented, right? The only yeah. other person that I know of that did it was Michelle Parmigiani who did it in a pocket watch also, right? So similar right. to Breguet. So they're the first ones to do it in an actual wristwatch. So that's another one. Another one is Ferdinand Bertoud, which is often another overlooked um, yeah. uh, independent watchmaker. They're the first one I've ever seen to do chain and fusée with a remotoire d'égalité, which is crazy. I mean, that. so we're talking two constant force mechanisms in a wristwatch that are working together simultaneously to achieve you know, the highest level of chronometric precision, precision right? So I look at it kind of the same way that you've been describing. I just haven't been able to word it in the same way that you did so eloquently, right? But yeah, so the idea is the theory of telling time, right? That's what's most important is how time is told because, you know, so often we look at a piece, right, that sells for the dollar. We look at the dollar amount, right? And we think that must be important because it sells for so much money. And really it's not often the case, right? Because a lot of the time watches sell for a huge premium for a number of reasons, right? But you know, it's hype and, you know, people read about it and they get enthralled by it and what have you, right? But Green it goes back to Oh, yeah. There that's, you go. That's one of them. Here's I mean, a poster crazy. child this week, at least. Yeah. But what's even more interesting is I've also been looking into purchasing older watches. Now, I'm not a pocket watch collector and I won't be, but I really have been looking carefully and I'm getting closer to getting my hands on some of the first Swiss levers by Mudge and Earnshaw. You know, because I think we're going to have the kind of watch collection I have, and these watch, the, these horologists, these builders, are building their entire. And it doesn't matter whether it's Rexep or it's Dufour or Swiss Lever or it's Coaxial with George. They're all building everything on the, you know, on the foundation of Mudge, Earnshaw, and 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 maybe one or two others. And the pocket watches, now granted, they've been in most cases monkeyed with to a certain extent, pieces have been rebuilt, remade. So you can't find one that's all original. It's not really a sensible approach. But if you're okay with that, you know, you can find these, I'd like to get a couple of really good pocket watches. These wouldn't be wearers or carriers. These would be just things to have historically because they cost, and you're talking about the cost, uh, you know, differential excessively less than, well, almost all the watches to a certain extent that we've been discussing here today. Um, so, you know, that's something else that, that's of interest to me that, that I'd really like to have in my hand and I'd like to own and I'd like to be able to sort of, you know, um, you know, have in relation to the watches that I wear. So I just feel like also you can go backwards further than most people would normally think you can and you can really buy the historical founders the true antecedents of of everything that we know and understand today and it's still out there which is what's amazing and it's not even as expensive as you'd think which is even more amazing right. so by the way i i know you just jumped on the stream for the first time but i just want to bring this out the real cars and crows says the one night i'm out because i know he's probably itching to talk to you right now he's a big watch enthusiast, art enthusiast, car enthusiast. So I'm sure he'd love to have this conversation. So of course, 
I just want to extend an invitation. I'm not wrapping up anytime soon or if, for as long as you want to stay, you know, if ever you want to. Yeah, no, I, 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 I would love to have you back on. I want to say that before anything, you know what I mean? It's been yeah, a, sure. well, thanks for, you know, I just sort of wandered in here. So it's very and watch guy as well saying if I wish I was able to join you, a, a lot of, a lot of great collectors with a, a lot of great insight. Definitely. I'm sure itching to speak with you, but listen, I mean, I think you brought up something that's very important. I'd love to get your kind of perspective on this, which is the watch market that we have today, right? So I want to say like the, the turning point was the Paul Newman Daytona auction, right? It was 2017. Mm. And that's really so when the it, turning point was way before that. Way before that. Think so? way, like 10 years ago yeah. before that kind so, of. So the mind. reason I say that, right? Yeah, is because what's, your, yeah, what's your take? Right. So 2017, right? Rolex was still available at retail, right? But after that auction, it that. became crazy, right? Every, everybody started viewing watches as a financial asset, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of the idea, right? Or yeah. some form of like, uh, it was like a building a stock portfolio, right? You would have your Rolex, you would have your padding, your AP, mm -hmm. you know, and, and kind of the other models that a lot of collectors seek out, right? But I'd love to get your kind of take and perspective on this current market, which has just gone absolutely bananas right and a lot of the energy i feel is misdirected in you know models that are very well made well executed and historically important like the royal oak like the nautilus but in my opinion there's just so many more important watches out there so i'd love to get your perspective kind of on the market today as you see it well i mean look i'm relatively new to the market but i've done some historical market study and 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 I hear what you're saying about, you know, particularly the Rolex and the Paul Newman and how that affected the market. I've never bought anything from an AD. I've never wandered into an AD. I've never had a discussion with an AD, really. Um, I have no interest in having a discussion with an AD. Um, so, um, you know, um, or at no least- No Rolex. I haven't <laughs> yet. Well, but if I were gonna buy a Rolex again, you know, I'm just saying like, I'd want a 6,200 big crown or an Explorer from like, you know, the, right. the late fifties, you know, I you want the original, if you're going to buy the thing, you know, I want the inflection point when that thing created a language, not when it was like turned into a novelty dancing bear act, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, I, I want a classic big crown 6538, right? I want a 6200. Like those are the sorts of things that if I were a Rolex guy, like I would be going for, you know, in, in a big way. Uh, finding them, good luck. I mean, I know a couple of Rolex guys to talk to, but, you know, tricky for sure, particularly yeah. with condition and all sorts of other variabilities. And that's another, I just stay away from vintage watches because I don't understand the market. One day it's okay if things are polished. The next day it's a shit show if things are polished. Uh, one day it's okay if it's if it was, you know, if it, if it went, if it had worked on it by the, um, you know, at the, at the, you know, the original, the original you know, creator, another day, it's like, you know, uh, you know, an, an epic generation scarring tragedy, if it had work done, you know, and it's just like right now, the pendulum swings back and forth. I, I get whiplash from it. So while I look at vintage paddocks and I look at vintage Rolexes and I would be super interested in it, even with well-known watches like a 2499, which I've looked at over and over and over again, you know, one person says it's like the greatest thing ever. Another person says it's a steaming pile of, you know, do. And um, it's really, really, really hard. There is no, it's a dangerous place to be with that much money where things can like, like swing on somebody's opinion of a so-called expert who may be superseded by some other opinion by some other supposed expert at a later point, you know? So, you know, in terms of that, but to get back to your question with the market, look, this is the reality of the market right now. And this affects all of these markets. This affects watches and this affects art, right? And it affects wine. And I don't care if you collect comic books or you collect baseball cards, it collect all these sort of, for lack of a better term, it sounds like a bad word, but collect collectibles markets. Okay. Yeah. The issue is that right now, one out of every $5 that is floating out in the money system in the world was printed within the last 12 months. So 20% of the entire U.S. currency was printed within the last 12 months. In addition to that, you have a lot of people, though it's still a relatively small number, but you have people who created, I should say, a relatively large amount of net worth out of nothing because of cryptocurrency. So when you have tremendous amounts of cash or crypto, I'm putting that all in the same boat for the moment, 
that's bottlenecked in the hands of a relatively small amount of people, that is going to create bubbles because they have to find some place to put all that excess capital. They're not going to put it in the bank at whatever it is now, 1%. They're not going to put it in their mattress. So they're going to put it in places where they think in their minds, they can do the best for themselves in terms of a ongoing, you know, value or investment play. And uh, art has been one of those places for 400 years. And it's probably the uh, great, you know, godparent of all these other assets uh, that where money has flowed for long periods of time. Uh, you know, Rothschild famously said, you know, 30% of my money is in equities and cash, 30% of my money is in real estate holdings, and 30% of, or third of my money is in art. Um, and that's pretty much been the formula, more or less, that has been with many of the collectors that I've worked with for the past 35, 40 years. And with all this money right now flooding the system, it creates bubbles. Now, bubbles aren't necessarily bad things, and all bubbles expand and then eventually uh, deflate or crash or pop or whatever the word is you want to use, uh, also in their own ways. And there's no way to predict how or when, and anybody who says they can is an idiot. Um, I've been through enough cycles in my long career to uh, know what I know about that kind of situation. So. I think right now the market, as you're talking about it, is seeing a tremendous amount of capital that's been bottlenecked in the hands of a relatively small group of people. And one of their interests is watches, amongst other interests. Uh, and as long as they decide that that's a good place to put some of their excess net worth, uh, they will do that. And when they think they can find a better place to put their money, they will withdraw it out of the watches and they will go put it somewhere else. And uh, that's, I think, fundamentally. So I guess what I'm saying is what's not the cause of this is not that the business has fundamentally changed. It's not that watchmaking has fundamentally changed. It's not that the quality of watches or watchmakers fundamentally has you know, gotten way better or way worse in the last whatever it is, four, five, seven, ten years. Oh, okay. it's, 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 it's not having to do with any of that. It fundamentally has to do with that the, all this money has been shoved into the system and it's got to it's got to be put to work by the small amount of people who have it. So that's, wanna, what, that's what your market issue is right now. Okay. I want to get to that because I have kind of a different theory, but mm. I do I do want to get your perspective on this. So we got Bartsy with the $5. I was going to go to bed, but I can't stop listening to Todd talk. Race up. So I, I'm telling you guys, when I watched his episode of Talking Watch, I was like hypnotized. You know, you're such an eloquent – I'm telling you, I'm being – I'm not like trying to blow smoke up your, you know what, or you know what I mean. Like, like I'm being serious. You are such a like you have a hypnotic type of experience when you talk, very eloquent, and it's uh, extremely interesting. Again, thank you so much for for coming on the stream. I'm going to be on timepiece, gentlemen, next week. Come see me there. <laughs> <laughs> TPG's in the house. I love it. <laughs> Where's my hat? So Where's cultured. my hat? I love how cultured he is. So cultured. He, you know, he's one, of the, he's one stuff, of the VIP it's members. Like, it's it's like watching a cross between like the housewives of Orange County and like a train wreck. You know, in slow motion. <laughs> in slow motion. <laughs> So I really enjoyed. Love the, the analogy. You know, I really enjoyed the whole thing, and I also really like Roman Sharp's thing too. I'm, I, I don't yeah. know if it's a guilty pleasure, but I just, you know, I mean, I'm just saying, I, I find this, I find it all interesting and useful and and enjoyable. And like, if it's really not interesting, I won't watch it. But I'd like to think, as I said, I'm re relatively ecumenical and not like all highbrow, you know, about things. And you can learn great stuff from anybody. If that's anything that's right. I've learned in my career, that's right. you, know, you can learn from anybody if you're just willing to listen. Listen. So, and pay attention when you yeah. listen. Yeah. yeah. I want to get back to this Anyways. theory of the market, right? But I know mm. Watch Guy did, did give a very kind super chat. So I want to get to this question first. He said, What's Todd's opinion about Richard Mill? Okay. Uh, I'm probably not your favorite Richard Mill guy. So I'm going to, you know, you know, I, I, I'll be Next honest, I wouldn't, I, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to be careful with my words here. Um, 
I admire the like the engineering approach to the watches. I think that's like really super interesting. From an aesthetic point of view, I have a very hard time reading them. Like I, okay. I, I can't like read the watch. I, I've, I've tried and I have friends who have them and I just, you know, there's so much going on under the Sapphire case that it gets a little busy. This is usually why I happen to prefer watches that are um, more minimal just in general aesthetic design. Uh, this one that I'm wearing is probably the snazziest one that I have, but the way it's laid out, I still find it to be extremely, um, uh, you know, legible. I find this to be less so with meals. So there's a legibility factor. Maybe it's just my eyes and looking at small things now, you know, that's part of it. Uh, I do admire the engineering, but the general aesthetic of the watch is simply not for me. They're really big, they're really chunky. I'm not a fan personally, I'm just speaking for myself and only for myself of the sapphire cases and the whole, the plastic bands. I just, I don't like those. I'd rather have a leather band or a metal band, you know, depending on one's, uh, you know, whatever. And the, and the final component of this is that I think, no, I don't understand, I'm being very honest about this. I don't understand the market, the market support and the pricing for some of these things. You know, I mean, 200, 300, 400, 600,000 a pop. Some of these things, two and a half million, three and a half million, four and a half million for like, you know, the, the Sapphire Tourbillon. And um, when I think just, about watches, and I think the kind of watch that I can buy for 200, 300, 600, or two and a half, three and a half, four and a half million, if I were gonna spend that much on a watch, would my first choice be a meal? And in almost every case, well, the meal. honest answer is no. no. There are other watches at whatever the price level is that you would give me that I think would supersede a meal as the top priority. Right. Now, if I ever see a meal, that is, I consider at that price range, like the best, the best value and the best watch at that price range, th then I would have a very different opinion. So, so yeah, I, I'm with you 100%. So I will always say this, they're phenomenally made watches, right? Yeah. The engineering that, I mean, the movements, right, are made by Renault and Poppy, which is owned by AP. So right. I, mean, I said this on my stream, it's like a think tank for watchmaking, right? Literally, that's what it, like, Robert mm -hmm. Grubel and Stephen Forsey from Grubel Forsey, who's one yeah. of the best independents, they came from there. The right. Gromfelden brothers, who are one of the best independents, came from there. Andreas Streller, who's one of the best, most yes. of the independents, he yes. came from there. So we're talking literally a, a think tank of watchmaking. And they're, I think they get their chronograph movements from Vaucher. And then the rest, like the avant garde, mm -hmm. yeah. like uh, shock resistant turbions, all those stuff, they get from Renault and Poppy. So Renault and Poppy now owned by AP, if I'm not mistaken, also. Yes, so. you are correct. Right. That's correct. So, yeah, I want to get back to um, yeah. the market, right? Because you were talking about kind of, or you were discussing kind of bubbles, right? Now, here's where we defer on this, right? And we see a lot of people getting into watches, right? The watch hobby in particular is exponentially growing. Mm -hmm. So that's one factor, I think, that's causing the increase in the market. The mm -hmm. second thing is, is a lot more people are richer today than they were, you know, I want to say like 20 or 30 years ago, right? So in dollar average terms, yes. Exactly, I mean. yes. And you see more expanding markets, right? So as opposed to before where I guess the watch market was concentrated mainly, I would say in Europe and America, mm -hmm. now you also see huge uh, presence for watches in the Middle East, in mm -hmm. Asia. So there's a lot more like there's the pie, right? The pie overall has gotten a lot what bigger. What you're saying is, is correct. It's very simple. It comes down to wealth creation. When there's tremendous periods of wealth creation, these sorts of, I want to say assets, it's not really an asset, you know? Well, it is. These are not a growth industry, neither is art. But yeah. I mean, I'll use the word asset because it's a simpler word that everybody understands. Um, you know, these sorts of assets do uh, expand. So maybe bubble is a word that, makes you sort of back up and feel like it's it's gonna pop. And I don't mean, as I said, not all bubbles necessarily pop or some of them just have a soft landing. Some of them retract slightly, you know, the, they, they don't all resolve the same way. So yeah, but I think it's fundamentally has to do with what you're saying, which is there's been a tremendous amount of wealth creation, but that's largely due again to the printing of the money and the crypto dynamic that's happened in the, you know, the last, uh, 
since 2008, let's say that's like a, because that was the last great recessionary period, which was short, but it was still there. Um, so, you know, you're dealing with a 13 year run of wealth creation, which has been, and a lot of that due to crypto, which is really, really significant and, and printing of money. But at some point, you know, that daisy chain is going to stop. And the question is, will you still see the same sort of a global expansion that you're discussing? And will you see uh, people still having the same kind of excess spending capital that you're referring to and decide to be spending that on watches? You know, that, that'll, be the, that'll be the real tale of the tape. And if the answer is yes and yes, then, you know, your point of view is probably correct. And if the answer is like, no, and maybe not so much, which I think it, it is going to be, then, you know, I may be proven out. <laughs> you know, that's... No, listen, I think <laughs> considering the auction prices, right? Yeah. I mean, which have gone... Because <laughs> yeah. lest we forget, right? They're paying 25% on top of that oh. for the auction fees, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so we're talking about 20 or anywhere in the range of 20 to 50% over what you can buy um, usually on the gray market, right? In terms of price at auction, plus another 25% auction fees, right? So obviously there's a lot of speculation around money laundering and what have you, but- yeah, there's no listen, Right, I mean, like, listen, uh, those are it. unfounded. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's I some, mean, that, it's not the primary driver. You no, know, right, there's always exactly. gonna be some, but that's not so enough. To me, the primary driver yeah. is really the, the growth in the watch market, the growth in interest in watches. And sec secondly, I would say, especially new markets and new money pouring into the watch market, viewing it kind of, or, or third would be the, the people who kind of view it as a financial asset, right? Not necessarily a hobbyist or an enthusiast mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form, more so a guy who wants to maybe diversify their asset classes, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? Just to use that term mm -hmm. very loosely and say, okay, you know what? Let's, let's get into watches, right? Well, there's a third component to this that we haven't discussed because it, it, I do think it's a factor, particularly not, not in the stuff I buy, but in a lot of the stuff that you discuss on your channel, which is social media, has had a thumping epic effect on the watch market. You know, people are seeing their favorite uh, rappers and TV personalities and Hollywood people and musicians, and whether it's John Mayer or it's, you know, Ed Sheeran or it's... Uh, you know, Jay Z, or it's Kevin you know, Hart, or John, yeah. sports sports people, whatever, and they're you know wearing one's wearing you know the Daytona Rainbow, another guy's got the AP Black Panther, another one's wearing a Richard Mill, and you know, uh, you're seeing that kind of stuff, and I think that that's had a massive effect on the watch market in the last five year. I'm going to just as a nice round number say, particularly. Um, so I think that that has something to do with it too, that did, it just didn't exist before. Just what wasn't there. You, you couldn't see people like comparing and talking about watches in the way that they do now on social media. Right. I, yeah, that's definitely a point that's lost on a lot of people, no question. I want to bring this up because he says, curious about thoughts on Grand Seiko. I want to take this a step further, right? Because obviously they'll have their mechanical watches, but I think what they're probably more well known for is something that they've been developing for what, 20 or 30 years, and that's their uh, spring drive movement. So Let's, if you can or you want to, you want to discuss maybe spring drive movements, what you think about them, and uh, are they maybe the future of, of kind of horology considering how accurate they are? You know, they're still partly mechanical, even though they have a quartz regulator. Um, so I guess get your take on that. Well, I mean, look, the watch, the watch world is not a singularity, right? I mean, there are worlds within worlds. Uh, within the watch collecting world. And there will always be people who are only going to do, um, you know, are only going to have an interest in collecting um, purely mechanical watches. And there are other people who don't care at all. They're happy to collect a great quartz watch, like a, you know, I don't know, like, um, isn't the, uh, the Jean Vagabond? Okay. Yeah, you know, a great quartz watch, if they think it's a super cool design. And there are other people who will be happy doing either or, you know, kind of thing. So I think for the kind of collector um, who is not driven by the um, narrow-minded focus of collecting purely mechanical watches sort of thing and all that sort of stuff, me. Um, you may have heard me say that once no, or twice. I'm, I'm kind of joshing, but, you know, I'm serious, you know, like, my, you know, everybody has a different, you know, viewpoint on this. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, Grand Seiko 
probably makes one of the very, very best, and I think one, certainly one of the best for the money, um, uh, you know, uh, products out on the market right now. And, and if I were looking at that kind of, if, if my interest were in at that price point and like, what's the best thing I could do given the sort of limitations that one has, that would certainly, you know, rise very high on the list. I mean, what's your thought about it? I, I, are you a fan yeah. of Grand No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm more of a mechanical snob, if you will, right? I'm a purist, right? It's not more snobbery as much as it is I'm a purist, right? So yeah. I like, because watches have, they have a heartbeat, they have a soul, right? And having a quartz oscillator kind of takes away that soul, right? It's like replacing your, like it's replacing the heartbeat of the watch with like a, a, a yeah, anyway, like I, I don't want to put a, use a bad reference, but it takes away basically for me, the soul of the watch, even though I respect, you know, how long it took to develop the movement, uh, the accuracy they're able to achieve with it. And you know, the importance it has, because it's, again, it comes back to that theory of telling time, right? It's another kind of theory in which we can tell time with. And, you know, it certainly deserves respect. And I think it's definitely overlooked. Um, I want to get to this point, because uh, it is kind of relating to our watch market point. It says, can you talk about the effect of COVID on the watch market? And has it worked in tandem with social media? I mean, you know, it's really, I've seen at least it's my experience. I don't know if you guys have used this. I'd be curious to hear all of your experiences on this. You guys use Clubhouse? No. No, no, nobody, nobody? No, don't use Clubhouse. Okay, I've been using it and I've been kind of, oh, I'm gonna plug this in soon. I'm running out of juice. Um, I've been using Clubhouse and there's been like a lot, of, I've found a, a number of really good watch discussions, I guess, discussion rooms that I've learned a great deal from during Watches and Wonders. They had, um, you know, uh, all the main, you know, watch uh, companies, you know, doing not drops necessarily, but talking about what their, you know, new things to market were going to be. You could ask them questions, which was sort of amazing. Like normally you could never do that at a press release. So it was like a press release that was also Q&A from the collectors, not from the press, which was really great. I learned a lot from that. I didn't have questions so much to ask, but I learned a lot from other people's questions. Um, and then there's just a lot of uh, you know, specific rooms. There's some for like vintage collectors. There's some for just like, you know, people only collect Grand Seiko or collect Hublot or collect Rolex or, you know, there's all sorts of really interesting. And then all the magazines and blogs and things have their own, like, you know, Hodinkee has a, has a clubhouse room and Time and Tide has a clubhouse, you know, and all these people have clubhouse rooms. So it's, it's really super been, been really cool. So I would, I would say that during COVID, that was the biggest um, social media uh situation that really seemed to be a game changer and i think clubhouse got really i mean i hate to say this about covid but i think it was you know good timing for clubhouse that covid happened and they released when they did because they were sort of the only game in town and a lot of people were sitting at home and couldn't go places and like this allowed them to feel like they were part of a community and still having discussions with people and it was kind of they were very fortunate Right. Uh, I, I think so too. Social media is definitely one of the most powerful influences on the wristwatch market today. Probably, I mean, arguably besides auction prices, I think that's definitely the most, but social media is probably the second most influential just because of the power and scope that it has. I just want to get to this because we did get rinser with a five. I'm, I'm going to keep listening, but I have to go get my um, plug because otherwise. This yeah, of course. Be please, please, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah. I want to keep you on. No, okay. with five uh, Swiss franc super chat. He's asking thoughts on Accutron. Guys, I'm just going to mention one thing. If you have a question, please be specific because thoughts on a specific brand. That's not a, a very specific question. That's kind of the issue. You know what I mean? It's like you're asking what are what is our opinion of the brand? Is there a model in particular or something you want us to discuss please let me know i'd be happy to um but i'd be happy to to entertain the question are you you have to drop out i just want to say obviously thank you for joining thank you very much take care good night but Rinsler, well. please please come at me with a like, wonderful to meet you by the way wonderful so to meet you. all the best but yeah so we did get a question he's asking thoughts on agitron i just asked him for a follow-up right because like thoughts on a brand is very like uh like, is there a model or something in particular from that brand you want us to discuss? It's just, it's too general. You know what I mean? It's not a, I mean, 
unless you want to answer or you have a, an opinion on Accutron in particular or anything. Specificity, you want to Mr. Rinsa, specificity. Right. right. I, I do want to get to this because this, is a, I think, is a great question. Now, this is something that a lot of higher-end watchmakers will scoff at, and it's the use of silicon in, in watchmaking, right? Now, I don't particularly mind it, right? Paddock will use it in their kind of advanced research models, and it's becoming kind of more mainstream. People or brands, especially those who serially produce watches, uh, to use silicon parts. Now, the main kind of uh, drawback of it, right, is, and it's the point that those independent watchmakers who scoff at it kind of make, is that once you service it a couple of times, or, and, and let's say silicon breaks, you can't actually restore it to original condition, right? You have to replace it is the point. But I guess what's your thought on the use of silicon escapements? I mean, I personally don't have a problem with it because, again, it, it adds to um, a better running mechanism. It's more anti-magnetic, but I'd love to get your perspective on this. I think it's a really supercilious argument to, to, uh, to kind of diminish or down talk any kind of technical innovation. I mean, I think all innovation should be tried. Most will probably fail and miserably. But you know, if we didn't have technical in innovations, you know, think of how good materials got from the time of Earnshaw and Mudge just into the 20th century. Think about all the technical innovations that took place in terms of the materials, because that's what we're talking about, you know, in that 200 year period. Uh, and now that we're entering the 21st century, even people like Roger Smith, who I have on my you know, is is looking at nanotechnology to be able to coat the metal so that you'll literally be able to permanently do away with lubrication just because there'll be a nano level of a lubricant that is permanently adhered to the metal, which allows for, you know, basically the watch to never ever wear down due to friction. Um, so, you know, I say that they should try silicon. I mean, I don't, I would never want a technology thrown into a watch randomly without being completely field and bat you know battery tested or battle tested um, before you know it goes to the market um, just for the sake of novelty because then we're back to novelty again but if you're talking about development and the de horology has been based on technical innovation otherwise we'd all be having pocket watches nothing would have never been micro miniaturized small enough to fit on our wrist we wouldn't be able to have watches with like you know like that new uh, 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 I'm gonna butcher the name. Come on, guys, help me. Um, um, Yaga Kulter. Oh, Jaga Kult. Yeah, the, the new reversal with four sides to it. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the new one. One. Like that was like unthinkable, you know, not 200 years ago, like maybe 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Unthinkable. So I'm all for technical innovation. And I think any argument against it is like really Luddite, low hand, knuckle dragging, you know, masked foreheaded sort of Neanderthal kind of silliness. Um, but if things are just being done for the sake of novelty, you know, then they're not as of interest to me as if somebody's really trying to ideally develop and really push the language of horology forward, such as the case with say the Daniel's coaxial escapement, which is why I was super interested in that. So, you know, case in point. So I just want to get back to this super chat and yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you hundred percent. And I want to get to a comment that I thought was very interesting, but Rinser did uh, pay five Swiss francs asking you about Accutron. He's talking in particular about the space view slash DNA. So the same kind of idea that we, um, dissected Grand Seiko and the, um, the spring drive movement. I guess he wants you to break down the uh, the space space view from Accutron. I mean, interesting technology, right? It's that whole smooth sweep, quartz regulated type of movement, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know enough about this one. So yeah. somebody else is gonna jump in, I hope. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's a quartz watch. And the, I think the whole point is that it has a smooth sweep of the second hand, right? So it has some yeah. regulating mechanism, oh. I assume, that doesn't allow it to tick, right? Just kind of a smooth sweep around the dial. Mm -hmm. um, similar to like very high beat movements, like like Frederick Constant came out with uh, like a 50 or, oh geez, I can't remember what it is, but it's a, it's like a absolutely outrageous like a beat rate, right? And it has like a silly, it has no escapement actually. It's just like a silicon uh, balance or something like that. Crazy. <laughs> it, this, the, the point is this, the sweep of the second hand is super smooth, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, listen, it's interesting technology, right? Again, 
another theory of telling time, but it's mostly a quartz watch, right? So it's yes. Not, What's the price, guys? Just curious. Oh, it's a couple hundred, I think, dollars. Right? Oh, well, yeah, like why not? I like everybody should have one. I think that's great. You know, something oh, okay, like okay. So this one is nine hundred bucks. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it's the old Boulevard, right. back oh, in the seventies. Okay. Got it. Well, that's. I mean, that's. A, and you know, it's a nice looking. It's a nice looking thing for a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. Right? Very I much in that you can buy a lot worse for more. Anyway. Yeah. Now this is but, a good point, right? And I think it relates back to one of our initial conversations saying almost all development in watchmaking in the last 50 years is material science. And I a hundred percent agree with this, right? You're not see well, not almost not all, but again, almost, right? So from a complications perspective, there's not a lot of stuff that we're mastering that or that watchmakers are mastering that is new, relatively speaking, right? It's mostly been achieved, right? Even F.P. Jorn's resonance, it's the first time he did it in a wristwatch, right? But Abraham Louis Brege did it in a pocket watch years ago. It's just right. nobody had been able to replicate it, right? I mean, the coaxial escapement is the only real, the only new development. Say, significant right. leap forward that was able yes. to go into a production situation. Right. Uh, you know, it's one thing to like have a breakthrough and it can only like be used once in like a very complicated way, but you can't apply it to real life. But in terms of like real life application that I'm aware of in the last century, it's, only, uh, it's probably the coaxial statement is the yeah. only actual physical uh, horological leap forward. And I think everything else has probably been material science. Yes. Right. And we could talk about the, co I do want to get into a discussion about this, but we did get a very kind super chat Toyotomo with $10. Toyotomo, if you have a question, oh, here, here it is. He said, great job, Marco at the watch card. Thank you, Todd Levin for joining the stream tonight. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. He says later guys, Toyotomo, take care. Have a great night. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Now, for those who don't know, and I don't know um, how much you know about it, but I'm sure owning a couple of Daniels pieces and a Roger Smith, um, I'm pretty sure you must know a little bit about the coaxial escapement. Um, maybe if you can, you want to talk about what makes it so special, how it was important kind of historically in the world of watch. Well, no, I don't know how much technical time I'm going to take up, and I don't know how much everybody who's ever on the feed knows, but maybe a, a bit of historical context would be more helpful. I mean, a couple hundred years ago, the most, the, it seemed to be that the, 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 the most adept escapement that had been created because there were many different escapements being created and tried out and rejected and then rebuilt and retried seemed to be this one called the lever escapement. And as you re referred to it, it's sort of like the escapement is the beating heart of the watch. Right. It's the Swiss the, lever escapement, right? Just right. Like, it's yeah. the thing that makes the watch go tick tock or tick in most cases, because many statements don't talk at all. Um, and for 200 years, pretty much the Swiss lever and due to material science got better as, as somebody else just observed and, and more efficient in uh, how long it could run and the rate of time it kept and these sorts of things. But no matter how efficiently it was made and no matter how well produced it was made and finally getting into you know computer-aided design and everything else, the bottom line is that there was still a tremendous amount of friction uh, with this escapement. Even though it was the best of the bunch, it still create, had a tremendous amount of friction. And of course- Not to interrupt you, just very quickly. I know there is also, Brege had the Ishabmal Naturel, right? Which is the two impulsing, the natural escapement, which is the double impulsing escape. With, but that right? could never be put down. Right. But it couldn't be done until recently with the right. help of computers, obviously, because yeah. you know the, the tolerances are so tight, yeah. right? Yeah. They were unbelievably tight. It just couldn't be done besides, obviously, you know, a genius of Abraham Louis Breguet and his workshop because it's important to remember he wasn't the one often working on all of those watches. He did have a very, you know, strong workshop of watching. But sorry. Well, please, as, as, as they did, as all of them, the idea of yes, a watchmaker making a single watch didn't exist. That simply right. wasn't the way things historically were done uh, right. ever. Uh, Daniels was arguably the first person who from, you know, start to finish really completed a watch by themselves without the use of a computer, which is all the more astonishing when you think about it, um, because it was before the time of computers. Um, but anyways, so, so, so there was still a tremendous amount of friction. The friction, of course, required lubrication. And that meant that that lubricant, which has gotten better over time, that lubricant would wear down. And every time the lubricant wore down, it would meant that the watch would either stop and um, break, or it would just simply continue to keep less and less uh, efficient time. 
and then it would have to go in for a servicing, hence this old term about oiling or you know, sending your watch in for a cleaning that all meant the same thing. Basically, it meant that the lubricant had worn down due to friction and one had to uh, clean the inside of the watch and add a teeny, teeny amount of new lubricant uh, and then close the watch back up and then it could run again. And the bottom line is that the Swiss lever the contemporary Swiss lever properly cared for, depending on the maker and depending on the situation, seemed to go somewhere between five and 10 years between servicing, uh, sometimes less if it was poorly made, but seven years seemed to be about the average, more or less, that they said you should send your watch in if you're taking proper care of it for a cleaning every seven years. And Daniels hit upon the idea, quite simply, that if he could reduce the friction and almost make the escapement frictionless, this would mean no need for lubricant. No need for lubricant meant that the watch would never have issues of the lubricant wearing down, which meant that the watch could, well, at least in theory, run forever without ever having to go in for regular servicings. And that would be something for him that would be very, you know, very salutarious. So he set about gradually designing a, um, a uh, new escapement and it took many fits and starts and it was something that was a gradual incremental process. It wasn't done all at once. Eventually he hit upon this, without getting too technical, this new escapement, which he called the coaxial escapement. And this escapement did indeed um, require far less friction, uh, which meant far less lubricant. And um, it was very hard once he had created it to get the rest of the watch world, the, the big people in the watch world, Rolex, Paddock, and so on, to be willing to take a chance on a new escapement because they had one. The Swiss lever, despite its issues, um, had served well for hundreds of years at that point, and, and people were simply not willing or not able to see beyond it. And eventually, Omega came in and uh, they were convinced that this would be something that could be tenable in a production watch, and indeed it was. And so now today we have the coaxial escapement. And as I said, it, team, it's, it tends to run anywhere between, I think with Roger's newer watches, I mean, anywhere between 20 to 50 years between a servicing instead of every seven years. And now again, with the new nanotechnology that Roger is working on, he may be able to get watches that will run without a servicing longer than a lifetime than, than a human lifetime. Which is absolutely, I mean, yeah. <laughs> astounding, right? And so, in most cases, these watches keep as good or better technical right. time than quartz watches. All right. I just want to get to the super chat. We have Rinser with the five Swiss francs. Thank you so much. And again, if you have a question, please let us know in the comments below. I'd be happy to pull it up. Oh, here it is. He says, wrong watch, new iterations runs on tuning for the movement with kinetic energy, costs around USD 3,500, collector's piece or dud? Interesting. So I know there's different kinetic based watch. Now I'm not very well, I'm going to be fully transparent. I'm not super well versed on this, right? But the problem with kinetic watches is you run into an issue if you actually set them down and you don't keep, keep them wound, right? So if I'm not mistaken, I would be very weary of buying a watch, especially at that price point, 3,500 USD. You're getting to some, you know, decently serious, serially produced watches, uh, especially for a watch with that runs on kinetic energy. I think it's a bit of a high price point in my opinion, but I'd love to hear the panel's feedback. Well, it's a mixture of battery and kinesis, right? So right, move, kinetic when, energy. When you put it down, supposedly the battery takes right. over if it gets to a certain point. That oh, it's okay, gonna yeah. stop. It's Seiko like was the first one that really yeah. came out with it. Yeah. So it's like a super quartz, let's say, or a mixer of analog and digital. Okay, that makes <laughs> sense. Okay, so I didn't think of it that way, but if that is the case, that is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the problem is, is thirty five hundred USD. You're starting yep. into to get into territory of you know, I mean, pre owned. We're talking Omega Seamaster with that coaxial escapement. Just saying, just mm -hmm. throwing it out there. You know what I mean? Could be an or interesting new, pickup. Or new Tudor. Right. New Tudor, mm -hmm. IWC. Or is uh, IWC. There is a lot of. Uh, which has tremendous, you know, pilot history and has also tremendous military history. So, you know, it's just, listen, at that price point, I think there's. It's a sweet watch. spot. Right. Yeah. There's good watches, a lot of good watches to get for that. Uh, but I know. appreciate what Todd says about the development of materials because of history and because of what computers could do. Because I'm. 
I'm the only registered architect for the Passive House. I'm sure you've heard of Passive House, which started in the West and in BC. And my friend, the engineer, is the only engineer, and I'm the only architect on this side of Canada that are doing it. We have a symposium coming up. The way we seal a house, that you probably won't need more than 15% of the average heating that a house runs $1,200 a year, well, you can do it with 100 bucks a year if everything else is sealed correctly as you build it. The way the forms are poured, that we use silicone, but we don't use silicone anymore. We use polyurethane caulk, not silicone caulk. Mm -hmm. Silicone does break down in time. Polyurethane, the new polyurethanes are used differently. And now, finally, Canada approved of what's called the DC-315, which is an intumescent paint. You can spray it on anything, and it becomes 100% blaze-proof. You can <laughs> take a torch at 1,200 degrees and leave it on until it empties. It'll get red. The moment you take it out, you can touch it. It'll never burn. So those things, just like architecture, watches are the same. Like you said, if he comes out with something that he nano-coats the metals, <laughs> like you said, a lifetime, maybe two people's lifetime that before yeah. anything happens to it. So, yeah, I'm very on innovation. I'm obviously, as an architect, I'm very involved with it. So, especially passive house. So, we just can to show, comment, right? Yeah, yeah. That is, imp that is a great, great topic of conversation because, uh, well, I mean, at least with modern wristwatches, right, there is some form of technical obsolescence built into it, right? Brands need a watch to get service to survive, right? That's the idea, right? So, that nanotechnology is actually contrary to the, I guess the the philosophy or the the desire for a brand to adopt those kind of technologies because I mean but not an would, independent not right, a, yes not an independent, not, interestingly right. not yes. an independent but not. yes maybe a brand because they need that obsolescence but right. for an independent who really cares about their customers the watch well, it's it's essence they're the objects they're creating yes. You know, there's a great quote in this book by Andre Malraux, uh, which I actually talked about in that Hodinky thing called The Voice of Silence. And the, he sums up, he's talking about art. And, and, and at the end of this book, this huge, thick book, he says this sentence, which is sort of like the summation of the book, which is all art is a revolt against the nature of man. Yes. And the nature of man, of course, is to die. Uh, <laughs> and so great art is a revolt against death, which is a revolt against mortality you you know art is a chance that you can live forever in very few cases admittedly but for for those that are able to achieve that they've sort of become immortal through their art it lasts for well thousands of years potentially at this point and so i think an independent watchmaker is more being akin to that you know i think that they're thinking about the watches they're creating as their children and grand who will go off into history and live beyond them and carry their legacy for them. Where, you know, if it's more like a brand, they're just gonna keep pumping out like the new novelty. This year it's gonna be the purple one, next year it's the green. You know, <laughs> we're just doing that. So it's like, I think it's probably less of a concern until the price point becomes attractive enough that it's like silly not to engage the technology because it's so cost effective. Right. But yes, hundred percent. I think that's that's definitely an important point, right? It's not may not be something that's adopted, but I mean, let's be honest, right? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I already forget the name of the architect who built the ho the home, right? Or that you? Oh, really Frank liked. Lloyd Wright. Oh, Frank right. Lloyd Wright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright, right? But not everybody is like him, I'm sure, right? No, He's definitely not. Nine. So it's the same same idea with the independent watchmakers, right? There might be people who build like there might be many architects who build many homes, but there are few like him who will build homes with a specific vision and and oh. you know materials they'll use special materials and but in the same way you know right as we talked about earlier he wasn't concerned necessarily he was he was grasping for an ideal which may yeah. have been beyond his ability at the time but he knew technology would catch up with him and like oh, yeah. Roger, when you're talking about somebody who's working like with nanotechnology in an interesting way there's a corollary Right. argument there. It's the same kind of attitude, if that's the right word, or it's this, it's the same, you know, type of, of, of sort of worldview, I think. Uh, yeah. Again, it's this issue of development versus novelty. 
Right. So, and that's kind of the problem, right? Because he comes from the school of Daniels, which is very old fashioned, very traditional, yeah. make everything in house. Yeah. And to use nanotechnologies, I mean, by Daniel's standards, no offense, it would probably be a sin, right? I mean, it'd be a cardinal sin. Unforgivable. And, and, and that's what's so interesting about Roger is that, you know, he's so respectful, obviously, as he should be, but, but genuinely is you know, about what George did for him and, and everything George taught him. And, you know, he's still, you know, George is a living, breathing presence in his workshop. In fact, he, George left Roger his workshop and Roger transported George's entire workshop and it is now in his workshop in the Isle of Man as a museum. They, you know, and they even still use some of the tools, but fundamentally it's there. You can walk through George's workshop if you visit Roger, right. which is sort of amazing. <laughs> but um, so Roger's really interesting in that he looks backwards and refracts everything that went before him that he learned, but he still manages to kind of transmute that through the crucible of his own personality, of his own personal style to like push the language forward. He's not just interested in like, like uh, riffing on everything that went in the past and that's good enough, which for most people being that it's Daniels would be good enough but he wants to push that language forward, which is like with the watch I was telling you that I own, where he's slightly updated the coaxial movement. Now he's working with like nano. And in fact, George hated open dials. He thought they were terrible. He loved looking at the back of a watch open, but he thought he, he thought they were too busy and didn't like them. But like, what do I have? I, I've got an open dial by Roger because he felt that he had resolved the open dial question in a way that George simply wouldn't have. So it's interesting. He's a really interesting case in that he looks Janice faced both to the past and to the future simultaneously and manages to do so respectfully, you know, to both without prioritizing one over the other. That's a pretty difficult trick to pull off, to be quite honest. Very few artists or horologists are able to do that. Right. And I think it kind of speaks to Roger coming into his own, right? Because obviously, yeah. You know, it's the late great George Daniels, may he rest in peace, right? Has you know been gone from us for for quite some time, right? It's almost a decade at this point. Yep. Um. So you know, it's it's him coming into his own as a watchmaker while still yeah. being respectful to the kind of upbringing that he had, right? The the kind of mentor that he that he had. And George worked alone, as you know, except for Roger later in his life. But now Roger has a small group of like I don't know, it's six or eight guys who he's mentoring and who work with him. You know, so he has more of an atelier kind of dynamic. He doesn't see the need that he has to work the way George worked on one watch at a time, producing largely one watch a year. You know, he wants to be able to build 12 watches a year and he can't do that by himself. So he's, a, you know, so it's like he employs computers to certain levels because he finds them to be useful and to um, help him do some things that he might not otherwise be able to do, or at least as efficiently. So he's not afraid or, you know, he doesn't consider it disrespectful. You know, so it's it's a really interesting mix. It really is that you bring it up. Yeah, and listen, I mean, it speaks to I think the tradition of watchmaking, but also taking it in context of the 21st century, right? I mean, computers are an engine or a tool that are unlike anything else, right? I mean, especially specifically with watchmaking, we're talking about the natural escapement from reggae, right? And that was another breakthrough that hadn't been done in, you know, two, 300 years, right? Just because nobody could replicate it. The tolerances were so like minuscule, right? We're talking about so tight yeah. that it would just throw off the accuracy of the watch entirely, right? And now because of computers, it's, you know, pretty easy to, to make it because we're able to experiment using obviously computers. Well, that's why it's all the more magical when you look at something like a Daniel Space Traveler or The Grand Complication and to realize that he made all of that by himself, by hand, in a studio on the Isle of Man without a computer. Right. Which, for those who don't know, right, we're talking about a mini repeater, tourbillon. Um, geez, uh, here, let me pull it up in, in uh, so the Space Traveler. Yeah. Or the grand complication is really right. It is grand comp, right? It's yeah. pièce à la résistance. That's right? probably the, the great one. Although everybody knows the space traveler better. Yeah. Right. So this is the watch itself. Here it is. Here it is. So we're talking now. I'm not. Sure, I don't know much about it, right. So on the dial, I know this is. Uh, so th there's two time zones, right? I'm assuming there are double two time zone. Uh, yeah. Yep and uh, up, down, and uh, you've got seconds there, and you've got a chronograph, 
and you've got temperature and you've got humidity. And then if you turn the watch over. So let's see, hold on a second. By the power of Google, I will be able to find this. Hold on, that's the dial side. Right. That's not the movement. Hold no. on a second. This is the actual movement itself, right? Yeah, and then on the back is a full um, resetting calendar. Yep, there's the front of the watch. That's yes. the grand complication. You were showing the space traveler, yeah. yeah. So that's the front, yeah. So we're talking, uh, now, now this big date, right, I think was now done by George, or sorry, by Roger, right? So the yeah. date window he has- found, he, But he improved it. He found his yeah. own way to do this, that the- right that this um, square that's around the date travels on its own track. It's not tied to a center right. pinion. It's like an invisible track that it moves on. Exactly. I, really I forget moving. what the series is. I think it's one of his later ones, right? Series one. four. Series four. Series four. Go. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the idea, right? So it's kind of similar. Oh, geez. Yeah, that's it. So but very the, similar to the, the dial side of the space traveler. Yeah. And then obviously, um, it has this right here. So that's kind of the day window, if you will. Right. And that just travels around on its own track. It's not connected to a center pinion. Yeah. Right. And he and took course, away the hand, which I like it. Yeah. The hand is, I mean. is a little distracting on the other one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is much more, I find this to be actually a more sophisticated and elegant resolution yes. of this calendar complication than even George did. I think if George were alive, I'm, I mean, I don't know, but I think if George were alive, he would be like, well done, Roger. Well done. So, yeah. I just want to bring up this question because I think it is particularly important. He's asking, the watch guy is asking, Todd, how do you approach buying a timepiece? What is your thought process criteria to make your choice? Do you favor complications, evolutions, ennobling, guilloche, or all of the above? I don't um, favor any of those necessarily. Again, it gets back to what our discussion was, and then I'm going to have to run, guys. I yeah, favor, yeah. Um, I favor, the concept of the design, the concept of the watch and the design that that the watchmaker, that the horologist has in their head, and then how they've manifested that out into the three-dimensional world, you know, into the object that they've created. So again, it's less about does it have guilloche, does it not have guilloche, does it have this component, does it have that component? I'm less interested in that. I'm I'm interested in, you know the idea and the concept behind the watch, the watchmaker's language, you know, Dufour has a certain language in his watchmaking that's apparent, particularly if you look at the back of the watches uh, and, and you look at his anglage and you look at the way that, you know, he um, forms those, um, those shapes. It, it, it's a very unique language. Other people have copied and run with it, but it's, you look at it, you know, it's immediately, it's like Dufour related. He's created his own language of design. George did the same. Roger, that's why I like Roger now is doing the same thing. That's why I said I like Acrivia and Rex up because I think he's doing the same thing. So it has nothing to do specifically in any way, shape or form with um, a particular like sort of localized design component and complications or not. I like some watches with them. I like some watches without them. It's how is it realized? You know, that's really the question. It's not whether there are complications, it's how are the complications realized? Are they aesthetically, do they aesthetically feel like they are part of a whole or do they feel like a bunch of bits and pieces that have been just like thrown together in a case and they figured out how it was all gonna fit, you know, kind of thing. Um, and we've seen cases of that where watches can be incredibly complicated with all sorts of bells and whistles, but they just look like a bunch of stuff that's all been jammed fundamentally together. And it's not really, at the end of the day, a satisfying or particularly sophisticated, um, you know, uh, language that's been created. Uh, so um, I really look for watchmakers that are developing language rather than um, producing novelty acts. And uh, I think that that's kind of how I started and still think about collecting watches. That's an amazing answer. Todd, I want to thank you so much. I'm not going to keep you any longer. Otherwise, I know it's very easy to get sucked into these things. I want to say thank you so much. It's been no, it's really fun. I, I totally unexpected. So thanks for putting up with me. And this is like super, super fun and and and, and everything. So yeah, thanks bunches. The honor is entirely thank ours. So thank ours. you. Again. And I yeah. hope uh, I hope one day to see you again and uh, hopefully have you on the stream. And 
have a great discussion with some more panel members. I'm sure a lot of people are itching to, to get to speak to you. But that was Todd, awesome, guys. Thanks, Bunches. Have a really good evening. Thank you, Todd. Be Thank well. Thank you. Thank you. Stay so healthy, much. all that good stuff, and I'll catch up with you later. Thank you so much again. Take care. Man. You should make a video of this. Todd Levin was on your channel. Stefano, what man, an incredible... That was amazing. That was something wow. else, man. That was that beautiful. Hey, Jesus came off the cross and out of the bed to stay up to listen oh my to God. I mean, I mean, it's 6 a.m. now. I am exhausted, so I'm going to jump off. Uh, yes. I mean, I'm going to wrap this show up, too. I, I, I could listen to this guy oh, three forever. more hours without, yeah. without a problem. Todd is something problem. else, man. He's very eloquent and well spoken and mild man. Yeah, beautiful. I need, to take, I, I need to cut the stream. What I I'm gonna cut the stream to only like his uh when There you he, go. Yeah. That's it. Before yeah, it came yeah, on, yeah, get rid of it. it Todd Levin. The yeah, first and, part and, was redundant. We didn't care about anything that happened. Yeah, do it uh uh special uh Todd interview, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, I want to thank everybody for jumping on. It's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, Todd was an absolutely incredible interview. I want to say thank you again to him for jumping on the stream. I want to thank, for, uh, of course, for sharing his insight as well. I mean, it's greatly appreciated. It's not every day you meet a collector like him, and uh, it was certainly an absolute pe pleasure to be able to pick his brain. He's kind of like myself, I feel like, a, a real gearhead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The watch yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> so much fun to Except be no, uh, to geek out no with Bruce Wayne like and you, Pat, no Panerai, no right. pizza. Forget the, yeah, exactly. He doesn't go, forget those brands, they don't even exist in his mind. Right. I just want to pull this up. Thank you so much, Akur, for the five dollars saying congrats on a great stream, guys. It was absolutely unbelievable. Again, an absolute honor to be able to interview Todd Levin. I really wish he comes back uh, and we can obviously talk in more detail and get. Uh, some new panel members to be able to ask him questions. Guys, thank you again for joining me tonight. Thank you for all the wonderful contributions from both the panel members and from the chat, all the amazing people who donated. Greatly, greatly appreciated as always. I'm going to wrap this show up on that note. Thank you very much for joining. And guys, wow. as always, where You're like are Nico. You're going over three hours. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about.